Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today our guest is XJ Kennedy, a prize-winning poet who has returned to share more of his insights about poetry, humor, writing for children, and making bold choices. XJ knows a great deal about these topics because he has devoted his life to writing and to helping students understand the power and pleasure of literature. XJ has written 18 books of poetry and fiction for children, and his college textbooks are some of the most respected and popular in the country. Many aspiring poets have been influenced by his An Introduction to Poetry, now in its 13th edition, which is the best-selling college poetry textbook. XJ has also earned a fine reputation by writing poetry for adults. His prizes include the Lamont Award of the Academy of American Poets, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Los Angeles Book Award, and the Shelley Memorial Award, among others. Most recently, the Poetry Society of America honored him with the Robert Frost Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry. XJ, which is the pen name for Joseph Kennedy, downplays his achievements. Yet he has excelled and made a lasting impact because he chose to follow his own path and to ignore literary convention. When his contemporaries embraced free verse, for example, XJ kept using rhyme and meter. And he continued to employ humor and levity in his poems, even when some writers labeled his work light verse. XJ credits his wife, Dorothy, with much of his success, and she will join us today as well. Joe and Dorothy, welcome. It's great to have you here. Well, thank, thank you, Elizabeth, and for all that flattering blarney. We, we ate it up. Much obliged. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like that. You are going to do a mini reading for us today, and you are going to start with one poem and then move on to a group of poems. So. Oh, all right. Uh, this poem actually is about uh, Dorothy here. It's a, a love sonnet called To Dorothy and Her Exclusion from the Guinness Book of World Records. You know, all, all those wonderful records in the Guinness Book, uh, Dorothy does not appear in the Guinness Book, but I think she is a record setter anyway. I just have to explain a few of these records. So it's hard to hear poetry out loud, isn't it? So maybe this will help. Uh, there was a racing car driver named Craig Breedlove who uh, in, in, in racing his car on the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah set the world's record for the longest skid. And somebody set a, a record in Spain for whacking a hoop a great distance. And then there are people who play ducks and drakes, that game where you ploop a stone across the surface of a pond, see how many times it will skip. And uh, there are people who play that uh, Olympic style ducks and drakes around the swimming pool in the Holiday Inn in Amsterdam every year. And then there's uh, another uh, a record that isn't really legitimate, but uh, it's in the Guinness Book, or used to be. Uh, Helen of Troy was said to have been uh, the, the face that launched a thousand ships. And she's in the, the Guinness Book for having launched the most ships with her face. And then there was a physicist named Prout who claimed that the atomic particle, the proton, was named after him. If you accept that claim, then Prout had the largest number of objects in the universe named for him, which is a lot to introduce a poem by. Anyway, to Dorothy on her exclusion from the Guinness Book. Not being breed love, whose immortal skid bore him for six charmed miles on screeching brakes not having whacked from Mieres to Madrid, the longest running hoop, at ducks and drakes, the type whose stone drowns in a couple of skips, even if pity pats 
be counted plinkers, smashing a face, but having launched no ships, not of a kidney with beers foremost drinkers. Fewer the namesakes that display your brand than Prout has little protons. Yet you win the world with just a peerless laugh. I stand stricken amazed. You merely settle your chin into a casual fixture of your hand. And a uniqueness is that hasn't been. Oh, that's lovely. Was there something specific that inspired that poem, or was it just? Well, it, it was Dorothy and, and, and the Guinness Book. Do you know, that's the first I ever read that poem in public with Dorothy sitting right here. <laughs> it was wonderful. It lets the world know all the things I can't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's no disgrace, as there are things that almost nobody else can do. So, hmm. all right. So, Dorothy, the first time you saw that poem, what did you think? Well, I was pleased with it. Who wouldn't be to have a poem written about her? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, before you go on, Joe, I want to ask Dorothy one more question. When you first met Joe, what struck you about him and his writing? Well, I think that I met him and his writing at two different times. Mm. Um, the first time that he asked me out and we went out together, um, the evening did not go as smoothly as it might have. It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then some time went by and then I began to read his poems, by which I was very much impressed. And <laughs> I think it could be said that the second date and others after that went better. The, the first date, Dorothy was at the time a counselor in a Michigan residence hall for girls. And she had to get back to the dormitory by a certain hour. And when I we got my back, key. <laughs> when we got back, all the girls were madly and desperately being embraced by their dates so they could get inside before the curfew. And it just you know, it was one of the crummy things about that first date. <laughs> mm -hmm. So your poetry actually saved you. It gave you a second chance with Dorothy. Oh, hey, it's worth writing this stuff, huh? Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that later. But now, Joe, you have some more poems that you want to share. Well, I thought to read you uh, a few poems for children, since they've occupied a, a large part of my efforts. And uh, there's a new book called City Kids that's uh, about to come out in this country. It's out already in Canada from Tradewind Books. And it's all poems about kids who live in cities, like, uh, like this one about playing hockey in Lansbury Park, which happens to be a, a park in Windsor, Ontario. The, uh, the artist, uh, Philippe Benat, has shown a, a kid hitting a hockey puck. Uh, and the, the little poem goes, playing hockey, feeling cocky, whizzing down the ice, swing my stick double quick, sink a goal in twice, more sticks whack, fresh attack, but I'm slightly slow to duck the puck. What bad luck. Where'd my front teeth go? <laughs> and uh, here's one about uh, a teacher. The, 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 the speaker is a boy who, who doesn't like his teacher, but who figures maybe she's worthwhile after all. It's called Miss Falk. The oldest teacher in our school is Miss Rosetta Falk. She's grimmer than a graveyard ghoul. Her head hair's white as chalk. Her glasses glass is ice cube thick. It works just like a mirror. 
to let her look behind her back and see us all the clearer. I'd like to tell a crocodile, go get Miss Falk and feed. But maybe I'll just wait a while till she learns me how to read. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you just one more of these. I think that uh, poems for kids ought to, ought to well, uh, adults, I'll start again. If, if uh, a poem for kids is going to reach them, it has to reach adult listeners too. So I hope this one does. It's called Keeping the Beat, and it's a sort of street performer's rap. Who needs to sleep? Why take time to eat? All I want to do is keep the beat. Want to race like a spaceship? Decompress? Want to rock it uptown like the Pony Express? Want to be a mosquito? Want to flit and fly? Cut a slice of sidewalk like a piece of pie? Want to do a handstand? Run round on my knees? Want to buzz you, honey, like a bunch of bees? Want to keep on rolling like a real steel wheel? Want to shock people like an electric eel? Drive lazy toes crazy? Light a heat in your feet? Any old way I can keep that beat. Very nice. Now, when you were introducing one of those poems, you said that in order to reach the children, you have to reach adult readers as well. Can you explain that statement? Well, uh, if you're writing books of verse for children, it's not going to be the kids who are going to buy them. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's going to be the, the parents and grandmothers and uh, people looking for birthday gifts. And so that's why, uh, and of course, a, a little kid who might not be able to read very well yet is going to have books read to him or her. So uh, it's, it, the, the poems for kids tend to filter through adults one way or another in order to reach the kids. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. How do you reach the adults, though, with poems for children? Well, I don't know that it's any different from trying to reach adults with poems for adults. You, I, th I think it, it helps if, if a poem is uh, at least partially understandable. Uh, there are poems that don't worry about that, and maybe some are pretty good, but I've always found it, it makes uh, better sense to try and make your meaning clear if you possibly can which is one reason I always ask Dorothy to read every poem over before I send it out to see if there's anything in it that's totally foggy or incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So Dorothy, when you're reading his poems, are there certain things you look for? Not really. Um, when I'm reading them for the first time, I just go through and try to make sure that I can understand everything that's said in the poem. And if I can, then I do nothing. If, I can, if there's something that puzzles me, a sentence that seems a little more complicated than it needs to be or something, I just make a little check and he fixes it. Mm. Mm -hmm. She's a much better grammarian than I am. She's caught me up in umpteen untold grammatical mistakes. <laughs> and, Not so many. And, and uh, she's a good speller, and uh, that helps greatly, too. Mm -hmm. When you read his poems for children, do you find yourself laughing aloud? Yes, sometimes I do. Um, there's often a, a surprise in there to which the only response is a loud laugh. And she has good taste. I have, uh, I, I write some things that are rather vulgar and, and in lousy taste. And she has sometimes urged me to change something that might be offensive. Hmm. Sometimes you do change it. Sometimes I sneak it through anyway, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
One of the things that always strikes me about his poems for children is that he seems to have a very childlike view of the world, a very childlike voice. It doesn't sound as though he's really trying to to write for children, almost as though it just sort of flows out of him naturally. Do you get that same impression? I think so, yes. Um, I get the same impression from his uh, textbook writing. And I think he told me once that he always, he knows what it's like, he, fe he feels he knows what it's like to be a C student. Sure, I, I got C's myself. Yeah. <laughs> he tries to write um, so that everybody will understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could say that it always flowed, but you know, sometimes uh, what you write that seems to have just spilled out naturally took a lot of hard work to get it mm -hmm. to seem that way. Well, you're, you're a poet and a fiction writer, you know. Uh, you, you can't just throw it on the paper. Mm -hmm. Well, some, some people do, but they shouldn't, <laughs> or, or at least they should revise sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what has it been like for the two of you to collaborate on textbooks and also on books for children? How do you find the right balance when you're working together? It's great fun to begin with. Um, because the world of children's poetry is great fun, I'll start with the children's first. Mm. And uh, um, y you read through all the poems that you can find and decide which ones a child might like. There's just a great joy in doing that. We fight sometimes, you know, if we're putting together an anthology. And, and uh, in doing that, I think we had a rule that each of us could put in at least two things that the other guy hated. <laughs> and, and so we have that much freedom. Otherwise, we have to agree on what goes in. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Now, Dorothy, you believed in Joe's writing even before you were sure you wanted to get involved with him. And you have believed in his work throughout your marriage. I would guess that when he made certain life decisions, such as leaving a comfortable position at Tufts University and focusing on textbooks, when you had five children at home, that must have required a lot of faith on your part in him as a writer and also in the fact that the things would work out well. Well, I, I always have believed in him. Um, and also, when he decided to quit teaching, it was clear that it wasn't good for him to try to be doing the teaching, the writing, and the textbooks all at the same time. That's more than a human being can really do. So when he came up with the thought that he might like to stop one of them, that seemed like a very good idea to me. Um. Hmm. You see why I love this woman. She's always looked out for me. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can paraphrase, it sounds as though you take good care of Joe. And because you take such good care of him, he is able to take good care of the poems and other pieces that come through him. As well as taking good care of the family. Mm-hmm. So over the years, he has made a lot of decisions, and he has often gone against the grain, where a lot of writers embrace free verse, for example, he didn't. And he always stuck with the humorous poetry, even though that was not the fashion. And because of that and his choices, he has done tremendously well and he has really made a mark on the literary world. When you think about all of that, what stands out to you? Well, I think this is a, a man who 
knows what he's doing and he does it. Yeah, you know, it doesn't take any bravery to just write the way you can. <laughs> uh, I can't write free verse very much without feeling scared to be out in the sea with no rhyme scheme for support. Uh, so it, it ain't a matter of courage. And you, you stick to writing funny stuff if that's what you can do. You, you do what you can. Mm -hmm. But you made an interesting comment. You said that many of the choices you've made have not been wise from a marketing standpoint. So how do you follow what comes naturally to you if it seems as though there might not be an audience for it or a publisher for it, at least right away? Yeah, well, it may, it may be folly as some of the things that you find yourself writing like these days I've been I've been working on a long comic novel and I don't know that it will even be published because I think you know when you're 80 years old like like me publishers will say ah look at that poor old geezer he, he's he's not pretty and young we can't send him on a book signing tour around the country and he's so old there can't be much juice left in him. We won't, if, if, if we did a book of his and it made good, he couldn't do a second or a third or a fourth and, you know, keep us in cakes. So uh, <laughs> uh, it, it may be folly, but, uh, but again, I say you just do what you have, an, have a yen to do and what you can do. Well, my instinct says that when you finish that novel, it will find a home. I hope you're right. Well, when it gets published, you and I will chat again. For now, though, you have a song that you want to share. Oh, yes. This is called A Great Chain of Being. And that is a, 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 a way of looking at the world that was uh, prevalent in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. The great chain of being was the idea that every, every being in the universe from God on down is arranged in an order of hierarchy so that at the top you have God the Father and then underneath God you have angels and then you have mankind and then a little lower down, a link lower you have womankind. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing for the great chain of being, just trying to remember how it went. All the way down through vegetables, uh, giant redwood trees to Brussels sprouts or pond scum and, uh, and, and precious jewels down to mud and dung. And uh, everything knew its place. And together with the great chain of being, you have the idea that Earth is at the center of the universe. But then, as we know, in the Renaissance, something happened to shatter this whole neat system. So this song, Great Chain of Being, is sung by some guy who just wonders, whatever happened to the Great Chain of Being, and what do we have today, if anything, to take its place? <coughs> Drinking smooth wine in a castle, or digging potatoes knee deep in dung. Everybody in creation knew how, just how high or how low he hung. On that ladder with Lord God at the top, dumb mud at the bottom rung. Great chain of being, great chain of being. Well now man was top dog on Mother Earth, and woman was his marrow bone. And a woman giving suck to a child cut more ice than a woman alone. And the cruddiest of sparrows glittered more than any precious stone in hierarchy, in hierarchy. But then Copernicus picked up his hammer, Galileo held the spike, and they hit that great chain of wallop just as pretty as you like. Old Earth went flying from the center like the sprocket out of a bike. 
all its spokes busted, all its spokes busted. Well, nowadays, every critter goes rattling around, worked loose from that golden chain. And the angle worm and the angel can't connect with each other again. And me, I'm fixin' to let myself play out in the pouring rain, snapped off and dangling, snapped off and dangling. Well, now I wonder who's been sitting in the good Lord's old armchair. I wonder if there's still snakes down below and a blessed mother up there keeping an eye on me or just the credit bureau and Medicare. Is seeing believing? Is seeing believing? Thank you very much. Dorothy, when he sings like that, what do you think? I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that seems like a great way for us to conclude this conversation. Thank you both for being here, for your stories and your insights. It's wonderful. Thanks to you, Elizabeth, and thanks to anybody who'd listen. Thank you. It's protected. And the music I listen to. Protected. What about how I wear my hair? And the things I say and write? The Constitution protects your rights. It isn't an old fading piece of paper. It's a living document. The Constitution says there are three branches of government. So we're kind of like the fourth branch of government. We are the future of America. Find out how you can become part of Constitution Day. For me. For all. For real. Go to aclu.org slash Constitution Day.